So this little video is going to be on a sequence called Stern's Diatomic Sequence, and it's a sequence that kind of looks a little bit like Pascal's Triangle, but it's a bit different and has some, some interesting properties. So the way we're going to start is we're going to do the following. I'm going to write a 1 and a 1. And then I'm going to drop those two 1s down to the next row and put a 2 in between them. So 2 is 1 plus 1, so I'm going to add those two 1s. Then I'm going to drop down the 1, the 2, and the 1, and I'm going to add and add, put a 3 in between these, right? 1 plus 2 is 3, and 2 plus 1 is 3. Then I'm going to drop down the 1, the 3, the 2, the 3, the 1, and I'm going to put the sum of the two outside numbers in the middle. So 1 plus 3 is 4, 3 plus 2 is 5, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 1 is 4, and I'm just going to keep going forever, right? So the sequence that we generate is what's called Stern's diatomic sequence. So let's label these elements first. So I'm going to call the first one A0, the second one A1. Then I'm going to continue A1, A2, A3. Then I'm going to drop down the A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, and then I'm going to drop down the A7, A8, A9, A10, A11, A12, A13, A14, and A15, and I would just keep going like this forever. And the thing to notice here is that the terms that appear in each column, they just repeat. So A0 is the same as A1, is the same as A3, is the same as A4. A1 is the same as A3, is the same as A7, is the same as A15. Um, A2, A5, A11 are all the same. A4 and A9 are the same. A6 and A13 are the same. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, where do these terms come from? I might notice that A4 comes from adding together A2, and a1, right? Um, a number like a6 is going to come from adding together a2 and a3. And so this leads us to a rather nice formula for this sequence. It leads us to the following recursion. We have that a0 is equal to 1, a1 is equal to 1, and we have that a sub 2n plus 1 is equal to a sub n, and a sub 2n plus 2 is equal to a sub n plus a sub n plus 1, and this is going to hold for n bigger than or equal to 0. So the sequence that we've defined recursively is what's called Stern's diatomic sequence, and that's going to be what we study a bit today. There's actually a really interesting problem with this that I'd like to solve. So here's the following interesting problem. So on top, I've just written down uh, Stern's diatomic sequence. a0 is 1, a1 is 1, and a2n plus 1 is a n, a2n plus 2 is a n plus a n plus 1, for n greater than or equal to 0. So the interesting problem we're going to solve is we're going to show that the positive rationals are actually contained in this set. So I'm going to take the ratios of a n minus 1 over a n for n greater than or equal to 1 and form this set. And it turns out that this set contains all the positive rationals. So a0 over a1 is 1 over 1, a1 over a2 is 1 over 2, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because it gives us an alternate proof for the countability of the positive rationals, right? Normally when you see this proof, you kind of see this zigzaggy type of argument. Um, this gives us a, an alternate proof. Um, so let's let's start this proof. So let's, let's kind of write down our setup. I'm going to suppose that R and S are natural numbers, and let's say that they're both bigger than or equal to 1, and they're relatively prime, so the GCD of R and S is equal to 1. What I'd like to do is look at all numbers of the form r over s, that's going to give me all the positive rationals, and show that they're all in this set. Right? So what's our goal? We show that r over s can be written can be written as a sub n minus 1 over a sub n for some n bigger than or equal to 1. That's our goal here. Okay, and how are we going to do this? Well, we induct on r plus s. So we induct on r plus s. So let's think about the base case. The smallest value r plus s can have is 2, right? r can be 1 and s can be 1. So um, our base case is when r plus s is equal to 2. In other words, r is equal to 1 and s is equal to 1, right? And I can say, in this case, 
Well, what do I have? I have r over s, which is 1 over 1. This is just going to be a0 over a1. OK, so my base case is in my set. It can be written as a0 over a1. So let's clean this up and write down our inductive hypothesis. OK, so I've written down the inductive hypothesis. So we're going to suppose that whenever I have two positive naturals, a and b, and it, they're relatively prime, and their sum is less than r plus s, then a over b can be expressed as, whoop, this is a typo, so I'll start over. So here's our inductive hypothesis. I'm going to suppose that whenever a and b are bigger than or equal to 1 and relatively prime, and a plus b is smaller than r plus s, remember we're inducting on r plus s, um, then we can write a over b as a n minus 1 over a n for some n greater than or equal to 1. So anytime we encounter two numbers whose sum is less than r plus s, we're going to say, OK, their ratio is in my set. All right, so let's break this problem up into cases. So I'd like to show that the same thing holds for r plus s by assuming that it's true for everything less than r plus s. OK, so case one, um, let's look at the case where r is less than s. All right. The thing to note in this case is that r is bigger than 0 and s minus r is bigger than 0 um, and that r plus s minus r, well, this is equal to s, which is less than r plus s. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my a to be r and my b to be s minus r and use my inductive hypothesis. Okay, so by induction, I can say that there exists an m bigger than or equal to 1 such that r over s minus r is equal to a m minus 1 over a m. And it's not hard to check that if s and r are relatively prime, then s minus r and r are relatively prime. Okay, so in other words, we have that a m minus 1 is equal to r and a m is equal to s minus r. Okay, so let's put these together. We have that r is equal to a sub m minus 1, and s, this is equal to r plus s minus r, which is equal to, well, we said r is a m minus 1, and s minus r is a m, and then we turn to our definition, right? We turn to our definition of Stern's diatomic sequence. Well, what do I notice? I notice that a sub m minus 1 is the same as a sub 2 times m minus 1, plus 1, which is a sub 2m minus 1. And then I notice that a sub m minus 1 plus a sub m is equal to a sub 2 times m minus 1 plus 2, which is just a sub 2m. Right? So what do I have? I have hence r over s is now equal to a sub 2m minus 1 over a sub 2m, which is equal to a sub n minus 1 over a sub n um, if we let n be uh, 2m. Okay, so we've proved it for the case that r is less than s. We've shown that r over s can be expressed as a sub n minus 1 over a sub n. So now we just have to take care of the case where r is greater than s. Okay, so this case is going to be pretty similar, right? So here we're going to note that s is bigger than 0 and r minus s is bigger than 0. And on top of that, that s plus r minus s, this is equal to r, which is less than r plus s. So now if we take our a to be r minus s and our b to be s, we can use our inductive hypothesis. All right, so by induction, we can say that there exists an m bigger than or equal to 1 such that r minus s over s can be written as a sub m minus 1 over a sub m. In other words, a sub m minus 1 is equal to r minus s, and a sub m is equal to s. Okay, so let's use the same trick we used before, right? I know that r, so let's, let's write down s first. I know that s is equal to a sub m, and I know that r is equal to s plus r minus s, right? So what does that tell me? Well, that tells me that r is a sub m minus 1 plus a sub m, which we know by our definition 
is going to be a sub 2 times m minus 1 plus 2, which is a sub 2m. And then I know a sub m, if I use the definition of Stern's diatomic sequence, this is the same as a sub 2m plus 1. Okay, so what do we have? We could say, hence, I've written r over s as a sub 2m over a sub 2m plus 1. And now we can say, oh, well, this is a form a sub n minus 1 over a sub n. Um, if we let the following, we let, I guess we have to say n is equal to 2m plus 1. Okay, and so we've proved our claim by induction. We've shown that the positive rationals are equal to this set. I've shown that every single positive rational can be written as a n minus one over a n by induction. Okay, so finally I'd like to write down a generating function for Stern's diatomic sequence. And this will be kind of interesting because it'll tell us, well, what exactly is Stern's diatomic sequence counting? Is there kind of an interpretation of what these numbers, these a sub n's actually mean? So this will give us a nice interpretation of this fact. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the following. I'm going to write let a of x be the sum of a n x to the n, where n is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to create this generating function. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to split off one, the a zero term. I'm going to split off the even terms and I'm going to split off the odd terms, right? So I'm going to write this as one plus the sum of a sub 2n plus 2, x to the 2n plus 2, and I'm viewing all these as formal power series, plus the sum of a sub 2n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 1, where n is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so I've split it up into the even terms and the odd terms. And now what I'm going to do is just apply the definition of the sequence. I'm going to notice that this is 1 plus, well, what is a sub 2n plus 2? It's a sub n plus a sub n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 2, and I know that n is bigger than or equal to 0, and then I know a sub 2n plus 1 is just a sub n, x to the 2n plus 1, where n is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so we have this, and now let's kind of distribute this middle term out and see what we have. We have 1 plus the sum of a sub n, x to the 2n plus 2, where n is bigger than or equal to 0, plus the sum of a sub n plus 1, x to the 2 n plus 2, where n is bigger than or equal to 0, plus the sum of a sub n, x to the 2 n plus 1, where n is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, the first thing you might notice is that the first sequence looks like I've taken a of x, replaced all the x's with x squareds, and then multiplied that series by x squared. So this is just x squared times a of x squared. The second sequence looks kind of similar, but the second sequence, it looks like I've taken all the x's, replaced them by x squareds, and I'm missing the a sub 0 term, right? I'm missing the 1 term. So this second series that we have written down here is just a of x squared minus 1, and then finally, if I look at this last series, this is just x times a of x squared. It's x times the series a of x when you replace x with x squared. All right, so this is just x times a of x squared. And so what have we found? Well, let's clean this up a little bit. If you clean this up, you're gonna get one plus x plus x squared times a of x squared. Okay, cool. So let's clean this up a little bit and see what we can do with this now. Okay, so what do we have? We have a of x is one plus x plus x squared times a of x squared. Well, let's apply this equation to a of x squared, right? So this is gonna be one plus x plus x squared. And now if I apply this equation to a of x squared, I'm gonna get one plus x squared plus x to the fourth times a of x to the fourth. And then I could apply this equation to x to the fourth. I'm going to get one plus x plus x squared times one plus x squared plus x to the fourth times one plus x to the fourth plus x to the eighth times a of x to the eighth power now, right? And I can continue this way, right? I can keep going this way. And eventually what I end up with is that a of x is equal to just the product of one plus x to the two to the n 
plus x to the 2 to the n plus 1. Okay, so I have an expression that looks something like this. So let's try to interpret this expression. Okay, so we found this generating function for Stern's diatomic sequence and kind of let, let's now interpret what this um, generating function actually is saying. So in some sense, what, what each coefficient of x to the k is, is it's the number of ways of writing k as sums of powers of two, where each power of two can be used up to two times. All right, so this is what this generating function is saying. Um, and this is what's going to be called a hyperbinary representation. So let's kind of review what binary and hyperbinary are. So first, let's look at a binary representation. So I'm going to let n be a natural number. So n is bigger than or equal to zero. Um, a binary representation is a way of writing n as alpha zero times two to the zero plus alpha one times two to the one plus dot 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 plus alpha k times two to the k, um, where well k is bigger than or equal to zero and each alpha i is zero or one, right? And so if I let b of n be the number of binary representations of n, we know that b of n is always equal to 1. We know that every natural number has a unique binary representation. It can be uniquely expressed as a sum of powers of 2, uh, where the coefficients I'm allowed to use are zeros or 1s. Okay, so what is hyperbinary? Hyperbinary, we're going to loosen these restrictions a little bit. So if I want to do hyperbinary, I'm going to, again, let n be a natural number. And I'm going to write n similarly as alpha 0 times 2 to the 0 plus alpha 1 times 2 to the 1 plus dot 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 plus alpha k times 2 to the k, where k is bigger than or equal to 0. And now I'm going to let each alpha i be an element of the set 0, 1, or 2. All right, so now each power of 2 can occur up to 2 times. Right, so at most two times. Um, so I can define this function, let's just call it h of n. So this is going to be the number of hyperbinary representations of n. Right, And what we just found is that this generating function up here is just the sum of h of n times x to the n, where n is greater than or equal to zero. And what do I know? Well, this is equal to a sub n x to the n, where n is greater than or equal to zero. So what do we have? We actually have that h of n is equal to a sub n, right? So a sub n is telling me how many hyper hyperbinary representations n has. So that's that's pretty neat. 